Chris is the co-founder of Caliper Content Services, an intelligent content consultancy. He's the author of two books on intelligent content, one focused on data and the other one that talks about the business case for intelligent content. That one's actually coming out soon. As a principal content engineer, Mark's recognized for his ability to prove the business case for moving from static content to XML and intelligent content. And along with teaching and doing workshops on this topic, he's worked with a lot of companies designing intelligent content solutions and helping fix existing content solutions. Mark joined us on the podcast to talk about a key element of intelligent content, and that's metadata. And he takes what could be a somewhat complex topic around metadata, and he explains it in easy to understand terms. I think when you listen to this, you'll walk away with a newfound appreciation for intelligent content strategy. And one of the things that goes into developing the best content strategy and creating the right intelligent content solution for your organization. I hope you enjoy the podcast. Let's get started. Let's get started by telling us a little bit about yourself and the work you do at Caliper Content Services. Yeah, sure. That sounds good. Um, My first career, I was a software engineer. I went to Georgia Tech in Atlanta, and I got a degree in information and computer science because I love the math and science. And I learned about object-oriented design, and I wrote software for uh, many years. Uh, And I worked in a lot of small companies where they would say, hey, Mark, um, software is great, um, but we need a user manual to go with it. Can you can you write that? Because you know, we need to use that to sell with the product. I'm like, okay, had done that kind of writing before, but uh, kind of you know enjoyed it a lot. And then I, I fell in love with that and decided that I wanted to pursue a, a career in technical writing. Then in 2003 or 2004, I read Ann Rockley's book, Managing Enterprise Content. I learned about XML and content management systems, and I thought, cool, this is object-oriented content, and I loved object-oriented design, so I'm like, I get it, and I've just kind of been on that path ever since uh, to the point where in in recent years, I'm actually now designing software um, to be used by writers, so because of that, um, I'm I'm the co-founder of Caliper Content Services where we take organizations through a content engineering process in which we'll design an intelligent content solution for them that solves the content problems that they're having that are preventing them from achieving their business goals. It sounds like a lot of really interesting work. Um, but here's, here's a good question to get started with. What is content engineering exactly? It's, it's a relatively new term. I'll say new, meaning like, you know, came out five or six years ago, Uh, but it's, it's content engineering. It's, it's a type of engineering for designing content solution software. So an intelligent content solution is primarily software. And we've developed a process at Caliper that follows the best practices of software engineering established over the, the past 30 years. Again, we're ultimately, we're really designing software here. And it's got just just like the classic software development life cycle, it's got the phases, discovery, requirements analysis, design, build, test, train. And in the discovery phase, we're going to take a look at your content, your, you know, your current state of content and your content processes that you're using now and the publications you're trying to produce uh, from, from that content. So this is... Uh, a look at how complex they are and are these documents actually even candidates for an intelligent content solution. Once we kind of have an idea of of the the scope of everything that we should be looking at, you know, just how complex this this project could be, then we go into an analysis phase where you you want to gain an understanding of all the different uh, requirements for the different functional areas because an intelligent content solution, it's about authoring, collaboration, content management, publish and delivery. And you want to have a good understanding of, of your requirements in each of those functional areas. Like I said, it's, you know, it's, it, you're, you're going to go through a classic um, software design phase. So we're going to be creating designs for um, authoring templates 
where the authors uh, can actually capture the content that's needed to produce those publications that they're trying to get out the door. Got to have publishing templates to get those publications out the door, just how you want them to look. Uh, designs for workflows, content processes, uh, and designs for delivery channels. That, and we need all these designs to satisfy all those requirements. So then you got to build it. So this is uh, a build phase where you're either writing software from scratch or you're integrating some software tools together, or you might be configuring uh, the software of some, some, say some vendor that's got a platform that has you know, all the different tools in it and you're doing configuration of that. So that's, that's the build phase. So testing, training, those are, those are kind of self-explanatory, but um, those are all part of this, this content engineering uh, process. And again, it's, it kind of mirrors software engineering very closely because ultimately you're designing a software solution. And um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a process that you, you, you go through so you don't miss anything. Um, it minimizes risks and, and make sure that, that the solution solves all of your, your content problems. So that's, um, it's, it's a very interesting exercise, uh, but my favorite part of it is actually where you're going in and you're looking at somebody's documents and you're doing a content analysis and design to come up with those uh, content models and metadata that that ultimately become the authoring templates. You know the the authoring experience that the uh, writers are are typing into and capturing that information. So that's the um, I, I'm an engineer at heart. So that's that's the puzzle. That, that I like to solve is the content models and metadata design. I remember my days of um, content, software development and everything you said there just took me back to what it was like. <laughs> but um, but I, 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 the content design part I think is really fascinating. And I think that one of the key components of creating intelligent content today and designing um, your content models correctly is working in creating the metadata. So can we kind of go a little deeper in like what exactly is metadata? Metadata is a, I mean, this is a, it's a great, great point because th this is actually a key thing I want to talk about today. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, a critical part of this content engineering process that I described. So you always get the classic definition of, of metadata. It's data about data. And like, okay, well, that, yeah. that doesn't really help me a whole lot. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's data about a, a thing or the, the object in question. Okay, well, what do you mean by that, Mark? So I'll teach by example because that's what I, I find is very effective. So let's take like a Microsoft Word document. And if you click uh, File, Info, and you, you're going to get a, a panel or a dialogue with some properties, you know, the uh, in it, and you're going to have like who created the document, uh, the number of words in the document, total editing time. Well, that's metadata about the document as a whole. And so, you know, that's one little little example. It's data. It's also metadata about that document. Uh, another great example I like to give is you have an image file, so you. Uh, right click on an image file and you view the properties for it, whatever operating your system you know, you're using, I, I don't care, but you, you bring up, similarly, you bring up this properties panel and you're going to see different pieces of metadata like the dimensions of the, of the image, uh, pixel depth, color depth. If you're uh, in DPI might be the uh, term that you're more familiar, familiar with. Mm. So, if you're working with a photograph, you know, specific kind of, of image file, you've got uh, probably stored in a, in a JPEG file and you've got metadata that's uh, uh, this particular set that's called IPTC. And this is some acronym that was developed in the, uh, I think it was the late 70s that, that's used for recording 
information about uh, the camera and what camera was used to take the picture, the lens that was on the camera, you know, exposure times, f-stops, ISO settings, who is the photographer, who owns the copyright. And so it's all very uh, specific metadata to that content type. And if you think about, um, you know, who might want that, well, think about, you know, some of the latest digital asset management tools, DAM tools. That's exactly the kind of information that would be uh, needed in a digital asset management uh, system. So, you know, you you want to track information about this huge library of, of photographs that you've taken. Um, that that's how you make that happen is with metadata. Now, let's say your images for you know your world, your situation aren't aren't photographs, but you might have images that you want to track some additional information on. So in order to make that happen, you got to kind of build that into your design, build it into the content model for your images. Another example would be like web pages. If you've, if you've ever done any web page development, you've probably seen there's like a metadata header that's embedded in the top of the file. That's, you know, metadata about that page. And there's a, there's a, a variety of metadata that's, that's in that header. A uh, simple example would be a person and uh, metadata about a person could be, so you'd like take a resume. So all the different kinds of information you'd have on a resume, that's data about a person, metadata about a person, or a health system where you're, you're tracking, you know, the different health information uh, about a person. So, so those are some those are some simple examples, but they uh, they they work pretty well. Yeah, those are really good examples, and it kind of clarifies it really well. But I guess one of my questions would be: I understand what it is, but why is why is metadata so important? Well, it's gonna it's gonna be different for each piece of um, for each content type that you're dealing with. But in general, it it answers a question about the thing that you're applying metadata to. So we'll, we'll start with this. There's there's different kinds of metadata. So there's so thinking back about again our, our intelligent content solution, we talked about capturing uh, collaboration and workflow requirements, you know, content processes. There's there's a type of metadata that's about the uh, you know the status uh, and workflow for a piece of content that's in your content management system that tells you where a piece of content is in in the life cycle. So you you started authoring a piece of content, so it's in the authoring state. Uh, or it's in the reviewing state, or it's in the editing state. So that's what state is this piece of content in. And that so that's metadata. That's workflow metadata. Um, who's uh, who approved this piece of content? Who is it assigned to? Um, so these are all metadata fields about um, workflow that are going to be common to any document, any component uh, file. That's in the CMS or, or in the you know in the workflow software. So it doesn't matter what the content type is. If it's being workflowed, it's going to have you know this uh, common set of of workflow and status metadata. Right. Those, uh, but then we get into a category where um, you're going to have metadata fields that are unique to a given content type. Like, remember we talked about the photograph and that IPTC metadata, you know, yeah. so that's unique. And these are what I would say is a, a classification and categorization metadata. So this is metadata that's going to help authors search for and find a piece of content that they're looking for in, in the content management system. Um, flip side, you know, th this search metadata uh, could also be used to uh, as filter metadata by the publishing engine to filter in or out 
a piece of content from the final uh, publication. So it's it again it classifies classifies and categorizes a piece of content, and so it's probably going to be unique to to that content type. Um, so another uh, category or another type of, of metadata. So you can see how there's uh, a variety of, of metadata yeah. that that, com that that's a vital part of, of an intelligent content solution. Um, yeah, there's, there sounds like there's a huge amount. And um, I have another question, and I'm sure I probably already know the answer, but I'm curious to hear your perspective. Um, are writers doing a good job of applying metadata? Well, <laughs> it'd be it'd be interesting to uh, uh, to know what your opinion is. It, it's I've seen a variety of uh, I'll say performance across uh, the industries because I've, I've worked with um, you know so many different industries and airline, oil and gas, and sports and curriculum, and, and you just see a variety of of performance in terms of how authors. Uh, properly fill out metadata fields and um, you know some are more disciplined than others but that's not what bothers me what, what bothers me is that whether the metadata fields are available to be filled out in the first place you know like are they in the are they in the design so most of the discussions that i that i hear about and this is like at conferences or in in workshops you know, talking with customers um, they talk about metadata in, in terms of of applying metadata long after the content's been written like like it's an afterthought and that really bothers me so um uh, or you you've got an intelligent uh, artificial intelligence that that's crawling the content and it's trying to you know automatically apply metadata you know how you know how successful um, is that I, I'm not a hundred percent sure but um, another another piece of this this afterthought is uh, like if you have software like uh, antidot or zoom in that are Performing metadata enrichment, where you know, they're they're importing source content into their platform, um, and they're enriching it so that the metadata is available in the publication and in the reader experience, and 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 that's great. I mean, those are those are two great products. What I what I really want is is for metadata to be available in both the source content. And the published content, so that way it's available for authors that are looking for that piece of content in the in the source CMS, and it's available to end users slash consumers when they're doing searching um, in the in the published content, whether that's in PDF or Portal or whatever the delivery uh, experience is is for them. So it, it's the afterthought. Metadata as an afterthought is is what I want to get people to understand is uh, is bad and start thinking of metadata as a as a you know from the beginning as part of the design. Um, another simple example, so you can think of of index terms as metadata. You know, it's it is data about a uh, a content component or a section uh, or a topic. It doesn't matter if their index terms are embedded in the text, like inline, or they're applied as metadata to to the at the topic or section level. It's hopefully the authors have added the index terms before they finish writing or while they're or while they're writing. So, if you think of you think of a book and you uh, you know hard copy book and you think of the index that's in the back of it. It's a navigation feature, you know, that yeah. helps the reader find the content that they're that they're looking for. And I, I, I quite often will go into a bookstore. Um, have, have, how long has it been since I've been at a bookstore? <laughs> pick, I meant pick up a book and decide if you know if I'm if I'm interested in it. I'll flip to the back and I'll just look at the index terms to see what 
the book is about, you know, kind of kind of old school, but uh, you know, I, I, I know there's other people out there that would agree with me. So it's a valuable uh, navigation feature. So my point is, hopefully, the authoring tool that you're using uh, allows you to add index terms so that they're in the source, whether it's embedded in line or at the topic or section level. And hopefully the tool helps you have some sort of a control vocabulary, you know, so that all the authors are using the same terms rather than similar terms. So because you want it, you want a harmonized index. You don't want you don't want a situation where some writers are putting in singular versions of a, of a term like frog versus frogs. Uh, you want to control the tense of the of the the verbs you want you want everybody to say uh, choose reduce as an index term rather than reduced so you want you know a harmonized index and you, you you'll need a controlled vocabulary to help you accomplish that so you want a tool that lets you put in index terms as metadata during the writing process so it's so that they're embedded in the source so not as an afterthought index terms up front in the building of the content Thank you to the sponsor of the Content Matters podcast. Ingenix is a leading provider of agile content management solutions. You can use Ingenix CMS to manage and deliver modern websites, customer support portals, knowledge bases, and more. Ingenix software enables content reuse, true mobile and multi-channel content delivery, and insightful content discovery. To learn more about how Ingenix can support your content experiences, visit Ingenix.com. I have been and worked in so many content management systems where that metadata is not there and it's horrible. So I, I definitely understand what you're saying. So if um, treating metadata as an afterthought is bad, what do we want to do? Well, this this is where it's about content engineering. We we touched on this at the very beginning. Um, you need to need to determine the metadata. Um, that you need in the model as part of the analysis and design phase. So that if it's, if the metadata is designed into the content model, it will become part of the authoring template. For example, when, when I teach how to design content models, I often use the classic recipe model because everybody knows what a recipe is. It's got mm -hmm. a title and description, ingredients and steps. Uh, maybe it has an end result, you know, what what the dish should look like when you're all done, or maybe it's how you serve it, but everybody knows what's in a recipe. Those are the, those are the elements of a rest content elements of a recipe to determine the metadata, metadata needed for the recipe so that we can design it into the model. I asked, I asked the students in the workshops um, how people might search for a recipe on a website. Uh, we look at this search, and, and then we look at those those searches or queries that they come up with, and we reverse engineer them, again, engineering, to make sure that we have the, the metadata fields in place to support those searches. And this is the process that I, that I take um, all my customers through to help them understand how to how to design metadata start with start with searches and then reverse engineer it so here's an example uh, find all the recipes that are desserts that have the ingredient slobovian chocolate so the system is going to search for documents where content type is recipe um, and so uh, content type is our first piece of metadata that we need so you, you need to have uh, what is what is the content type of each piece of content. So other other content types might be restaurant reviews or product reviews, but we only want recipes. So content type equals recipe. So the system is going to search for recipes where one of the ingredients, and that's a content element within the recipe, one of the ingredients is Slobovian chocolate. Now, as I said, that's a content element. It's already in, um, you know, in the the content uh, in the recipe itself. So we don't need to add ingredient as metadata. It's 
it's in the recipe. That's a content element in the recipe. So that brings us to searching for uh, the last part of the query was uh, desserts. How do we find desserts? Well, we need a piece of metadata that tells us whether a piece of content is a dessert or not. So we could support that by adding a metadata field called category that has values like dessert, entree, soup, salad. And so when the author is writing a recipe, they'll fill out the category metadata field and, and select dessert from the controlled vocabulary for that metadata field. And so those three things, content type equals recipe, ingredients, Slobovian chocolate, and, and the category metadata being set to dessert, that's going to help us find that piece of content. So we just reverse engineered that, that search. Hmm. Um, you can call it a query if you want to, um, but it's you know a search query. So that's a fairly simple example. If, if you want to add uh, another condition uh, to the search, you know, give it, um, uh, make it, make it a more powerful search. Like I want to search for uh, recipes that are, you know, sugar-free desserts. Cause I have a friend that um, can't have a lot of sugar for, you know, whatever health reasons. We can add a metadata field called sugar-free that has the values true or false. And so the recipe is going to have a meta, uh, this, this metadata field that's a, uh, instead of being a, well, the controlled vocabulary is technically true and <laughs> true and false. You know, it's a Boolean. Um, that metadata field um, is, is going to allow us to execute uh, that kind of query where I want to search for recipe, content type is recipe, ingredients is Slobovian chocolate, category is dessert and sugar-free equals true. And that's really gonna narrow down what you, what you find. So instead of finding a, a whole long list of, of recipes, you're gonna find exactly what you're looking for. So th this, is, this is how we're able to build metadata into the, the design of the content model. And that's gonna enable intelligent searching on the intelligent content. So you, you have to design it ahead of time. And that's, that's, my, that's my key point. So uh, not only can the authors do intelligent searching at the CMS, end users or consumers can perform intelligent searches on published content. So it's a win-win. Both the uh, consumers, readers of the content and the authors benefit from building this into the design. So we're putting intelligence into the content and then, and then pushing that intelligent content out to the internet. It's, it's, it's basically object-oriented content is a, is a way to think about it. Um, you've, you don't hear the term that often now, but, you, but, but we've been talking about the semantic web for a long time. I think web 3.0 maybe is the, the new version of, uh, of that term, but we've been talking about this for a long time. And, and this, this is how we make that happen by designing intelligent content and then ultimately pushing it in combination with its metadata out to the web. Do your students and clients, um, do they find this to be a difficult exercise to do? It, at first. They, 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 they usually do. It, it's, you got to take it, take them through a, a couple of exercises and they start to get it. So um, the thing they always say at the beginning is when I, when I say, well, what are the, how would people search for a piece of content? And they say, oh, there's, there, there's, there's, there's too many possible searches that that's, you know, this is, this is going to be too hard or it's going to take too long. But I keep asking them, how would someone search for this type of content and, we, and then we write down the searches, and then when they can't think of any more, uh, then they say, oh, well, you know, I think that's all of them. And it, it ends up not being that many variations, because you, you, you come up with what you think is a variation, and it actually harmonizes to kind of a, a base query. But it ends up not being that, that many, uh, and, and, and that's just 
classic every time I take people through that example it, it's it's alien to them at first but then once we get into it they're like oh okay this isn't this isn't so bad so we take a look at these searches this list and we figure out what's the metadata needed to support those searches Can like it would go back to photographs someone went through this exercise uh, when they determined all those IPTC metadata fields back in the of the, the 70s or 80s, there was someone that said, I want to be able to run a search and I want to be able to you know, find uh, a particular photograph. And, and, and so to support those complex searches, I'll say, they had to design that metadata, the, those IPTC fields into uh, the metadata for the image files. And so this, is, this isn't anything new. People have been doing this exercise for a long time. Yeah, it's interesting to kind of see how it all works for improving the ability to search, but does it, does it also have benefits for, um, for other uses? Like, can you use metadata for other things other than searching? Sure, we, you know, we, we talked about some of the categories of the, you know, the workflow, uh, workflow and status right. and reporting. Yeah. Um, then there's the categorization and classification. Let's let's flip this around. So personalized content, that's a hot topic. Yes. Yeah. So instead of someone uh, searching at the recipe website and pulling the content to themselves, you could push it to them. So let's say that you're a you're a member of a recipe website and you fill out your profile. And you, you know, you're creating a login, you create your profile, and you you check the items that you're interested in. There's going to be some if they're if it's a smart website, <laughs> they'll 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 give you a chance to say these are the topics that I'm interested in, and you and you check those. And in this fictitious example, they check desserts and they check soups. And they maybe there's uh, a way that they can choose ingredients that they're interested in, like blood orange chocolate and Slobovian chocolate. You're making me hungry just saying all these chocolate <laughs> things. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> then let's say once a month, the recipe company um, wants to do uh, an email out to their members of their website. And they want to they want to automatically build this uh, email based on content or recipes that they know that their members are going to be interested in. So once a month, they run a search to see if there's any new recipes that match the items that an individual checked in their profile. So they're going to say for this user, for this profile, look at their items. Are there any matches with the new content that we created? And if they and if there and if there are, then they'll create an email with links to those recipes. So it, it's kind of just the opposite. It's kind of like the user running the query at the website saying, "Hey, I'm interested in these," but in this case, the company's doing it, and, and based on your profile, and they generate that uh, that list of of recipes that match your profile build an email, send it out. So you're going to receive an email that has that only has the recipes and and topics in it that you're interested in. It's not a blanket email out to everybody where you, know, you get a generic email in your inbox and you know it's generic. You, yeah. Most of the time you're going to delete it. You're just like, you're like, oh, that's that's just it's it. It's unlikely that it's something that I'm interested in. But if you if you knew that you were a member of you know, some content service or website that the emails that they sent were about just the topics that you were interested in, you're probably going to read that one. And so that's, you know, building up that, that, uh, that trust with that between the, the organization, the company and, and the, and that member. So this is, this is one way to deliver uh, personalized content. So again, personalized content is it's a hot topic. This is one way to do it. We talked about this um, several years ago at uh, Content Marketing World, and you kind of start to see the the light bulbs go off uh, with uh, some of the marketing people in the audience. They're like, oh, okay, this is 
this is how we create, you know, quality emails, quality meaning they've got content my uh, customers care about. Yeah, um, we always talk about personalization from the perspective of knowing the customer, but we never seem to talk about it from how do you get the right content in place and how do you know what the right content is to send. So that's kind of interesting to hear it that way. Um, mm -hmm. So your key takeaway is that it's a lot better to plan ahead and build metadata into the design as early as possible Definitely. instead of instead of after the fact. Um, so this is also like storing the metadata in both the source content and the published content then. Yeah, big benefit there, yeah. Um, we've talked about uh, we've talked about classification and, and categorization metadata that would be used for uh, searching and filtering filtering and reuse and and this this is this is all part of, of how we make content intelligent and, and more valuable and, and useful, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So if you were going to give uh, one piece of advice to a content strategist, what would it be? It kind of giving away um, a, a, a skill that I've had that I, I think gives me an advantage. I'm going to say uh, go learn object oriented design. Yeah. It's uh, methodology that, that I learned back when I was in college and in software engineering. And it's it's really a big part of my mindset when I'm you know, when I'm designing content solutions and content strategies uh, for my clients. It's a uh, I think I think there was a, a speaker at a conference years ago that said, figure out what your learning schema is. And I found that when I'm learning new technologies, I tend to think of the software, think of the um, what's being managed by the software in terms of objects and that kind of helps me um, learn um, new technologies and it also really helps me understand um, some, someone's content and what they're trying to accomplish with it so at conferences there's a book that I give away it's a great book it's an old book it's like a 20-25 year old book called Object Oriented Technology a manager's guide by David Taylor, and uh, I anybody that's uh, interested in learning object oriented design, you know, if they you know raise their hand and you know at, at, a, at a presentation, I'll, I'll give them a free copy of the book. So it's it teaches you object oriented design by using the human body as an example. So the, the think of the body like as a it's this big system comprised of smaller systems which are made up of organs and that are made up of cells so you have this big thing breaking down into so smaller things and the the book walks you through all of this and shows you how to think of the body and all of these systems as objects so it teaches you about about inheritance uh, which is a uh, which is very critical to this way of thinking mm -hmm. uh, quick quick example Think of all the different types of cells that are in your body. You have like nerve and muscle and, and, and blood cells. The book will teach you to think about, um, you know, like what does every cell have in common? Well, what's unique about a given cell type? And this is where, this is the, you know, not stealing too much from the book, but this is how it teaches you about uh, object design and, and inheritance. So I highly recommend it. Um, it's, a, it's a great way to learn object-oriented design, uh, which is will directly help you see how XML and content management systems are object-oriented content. I was going to say real quick, there's a, I, I actually gave a presentation on this to, uh, to the STC, uh, Society for Technical Communication, my, my local chapter here in Clearwater, Florida. Okay. Shout, out, shout out to the Suncoast chapter. There's uh, there's a link uh, on my website uh, on the Caliber Content Services website that's to a recording um, that I gave to the STC about uh, learning object oriented uh, design, and so we'll uh, we'll make that link available somewhere here in the uh, when we post this podcast. Um, yeah, so it's a it's a great book, and check out that we'll get you a link to that recording too. 
Yeah, I'll definitely make sure we put the links in the show notes for the podcast and in the description so cool. people can access that. It definitely sounds like a great book, but you're also working on a book. So last question, what's your book about? Yes. So our first book was Didametrics 101, which is about how to, to design content metrics. Our new book is called Making the Business Case for Intelligent Content. And it's it's very related to this content engineering process uh, because in order to uh, in order to get and to buy your new content solution you have to spend some uh, you have to convince some executive to uh, allocate funds and resources for it yeah and this is something that that i i struggled with myself many years ago and it, and I've, and I've seen other people uh, struggle with it. I mean, we're at our the roots. We're we're technical writers, and but we don't write business cases. So what I wanted to do was, uh, from from my perspective, being a, you know, a part of the tribe of of technical writers, I wanted to to show you how to look at your organization's business goals and content goals and content problems, and and use that to create a, a business case that would resonate with the executive. So that's that's the that's the elevator description of what the book's about. But it's just um it's just something that I that I I thought the industry needed from from the perspective of a, a fellow tech writer. And uh, so we'll we should be finishing that uh, that here in 2021. It sounds like it's a really good book. I would definitely that would definitely be one I would want to purchase if I was working and trying to convince someone to buy software solution, a content solution. Yeah. Um, yep. It's a, it's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine. Well, this was a great conversation, Mark. Um, I think I learned a few new things to go along with what I, my kind of old school thinking kind of brought me up a little bit. I really appreciate having the talk today. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, and uh, I hope that um, I hope that the audience listening will go off and take some of the ideas that we we talked about here and go and do further research, and uh, hope they find benefit from it. So, thanks, Barb. Appreciate it. Thank you.